Hi, I'm Grant from Blackmagic Design and I wanted to give you an update on what we have for IBC this year. Now we've got a lot of new products, we've got some new cameras, so there's quite a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Now first I wanted to talk about routers. Um, we have a new Video Hub router today. It's called Blackmagic Video Hub 80 by 12 g Now it's mounted in the rack right here, um, so you can see it with the other three models. It's four rack in its high. I really quite love this design. It's, it's so simple, but it sort of exudes strength and it feels right for a high performance router like this. Now the new model has 80 inputs and 80 outputs, um, and like the other three models, it's got uh, 12 GSDI reclockers. All the connections are 12 GSDI, so they, it does all the SDI rates. And um, it also means you can use any combination of SDHD and Ultra HD on the same router all at the same time. And the SDI connections automatically switch standards. Now it has a full master control built into the front panel, so it's so nice to use. It's got the large five inch LCD display with both light and a dark appearance, you can change that. And it's got the large spin knob on the front panel with a mechanical clutch. Uh, so the stop, knob stops spinning when you get to the end of the label list, but it also works in the menus when you get to the end of menus as well. So let me show you, if you follow me over, I'll go over and have a look. So here it is here. Um, and again, like the other models, it's really easy to change sources. We can just move and change sources. So simply you can hear the clutch there. Um, plus we can also change from the label display, which we have here, to the video display. So if I go into the menu here and scroll down, and come out of the menu, now it's in the video display, so we'll watch, it'll monitor what, what's going through the router. Now the labels are displayed along the bottom when it's in the video mode like this, so you still have the labels. Um, we've also added air, um, LEDs to the, uh, next to the input connectors. I've got a slide for that, I'll just head back to the side. Um, so you can see on the slide there that uh, if you look closely near the connectors, there's a LED for each input, SDI input, and it shows when the input's locked. Now also while we're looking at the back there, we've got the redundant AC inputs and external reference with a loop out. And also it supports uh, software updates via Ethernet and USB, um, so you can do them uh, remotely. Uh, plus the software control panel works via Ethernet. And it also works with all the hardware panels as well. Um, now it supports multiple languages. So now I just want to make a quick comment on repairability. Now this model uses internal SDI interface cards, which means if a connector is damaged, it can be repaired. So if you look on the, there's a slide there, you can see each horizontal road internally is actually a separate card, and they all plug into an internal backplane. So that makes repair a lot easier because uh, you can change the card out. So I think this is a great new model. Now the new um, video, Blackmagic Video 80 by 12 g we priced at 995. And the prices can vary a bit depending on government duties and taxes. But that's actually lower cost than the Universal Video 72 model. And that was a 3G router, well this is a 12G router. So we expect it to be shipping in around four or five weeks um, when we get the components in. And it's such a nice companion to the other models because the design fits in perfectly and makes it part of a great family. I also quite like the spin knob on the front, you know, it's so easy to use, it's such a nice way of routing. Okay, so we uh, now have a uh, next thing I want to talk about is an update for the WebPresenter streaming processors. Now this is for both WebPresenter HD and the WebPresenter 4K models. So we've added some new platforms, but the most important update is adding support for the Secure Reliable Transport Protocol, which is SRT uh, streaming protocol. And that's a mo modern streaming protocol than RTMP, which we've been using. So although SRT streaming uh, to YouTube's currently got limited availability, because you can only use SRT with YouTube if you've been invited into the beta program, However, you can switch the protocols, and so uh, we have it in there. Uh, we also have YouTube presets for both of those, um, so you, you, know, you can just select that. Now, RTMP is still available for streaming, um, so that's you know, always there. Now, another new feature we've done is we've added support for custom URLs. Um, if the streaming platform uses a specific URL, then you can just enter that in now. Um, we also added new uh, codec support for the WebPresenter 4K model, so we've now got streaming in H.265. This is often called HEVC. Um, and it's a more efficient codec, it's about 40% less data and, and uh, for the same image quality. So let me show you this, I'll go to the utility just here, so if you can have a look down. Um, you can see in the WebPresenter utility. There it is there, and we'll go into the WebPresenter. And you can see the platform menu here. Um, so there's now two YouTube settings, you can see them both there. Um, so if you're on the YouTube beta program, you can use this. And uh, SIT uses a passphrase for security, so you can see that there's a passphrase um, in there now. Now I mentioned you can stream to platforms that use a URL. And Microsoft Teams and Instagram use that, so you can see that there. Um, so now you can use a custom URL. Um, you can see the entry field there for that. Uh, there's also some custom URL sections where if you just want to stream to any platform and use a custom URL, then you can do that. So if I go down the bottom there, you can see those. Um, and we actually have two presets for that, so you can see there's both H64, whoops, wrong menu, and H65, and you can just enter a URL. Uh, there's lots of sites needs uh, URLs for streaming. Um, but these new features can be customized in the XML file. So if you're technically minded, you can actually go into the XML file and just customize it. So you can go in and change like the protocol between SRT and RTMP. Um, you can also change the streaming data rates directly. You can change the codecs. You can change to H64 and H65 on the WebPresenter 4K model. Um, and lastly, um, 
as part of the software update, we also fixed a bug that prevented streaming to devices on different local subnet networks. So that's a nice little bug fix. There's a few little bug fixes like that. Um, so the good news is this update will be free of charge. So the software is called Blackmagic Web Presenter 3.3 and it'll be available to download today. Now the good news is we also have an update for the ATEM streaming bridge, which I'll bring on, I've got one here. So this adds SRT support to it. Um, so you can stream from the Blackmagic Web Presenter to the ATEM streaming bridge. Now SRT means lower latency. It's a more reliable protocol for streaming. And if you're using multiple cameras with multiple streaming bridge, it'll keep the cameras uh, closer in sync. And now the other thing we've done is we've added support for a ULAW codec, an audio codec. Now let me explain how this works. This is for the return audio feed. So the video outputs here, uh, when you stream from a web presenter to the ATEM stream bridge, the video comes out of these connectors here. But if you put a video feed into the SDI input, this is the reference input. It's actually a reference input, but if you put video into this, it'll actually take the audio from that input and feed it back to the web presenter. This could be program audio or talkback audio, and then the audio comes out of the uh, monitoring output on the web presenter. So by using this ULAW codec for that now, we actually have a lot lower data rate back to the web presenter. Um, and the return audio feed is how remote cameras can actually hear talk back from the studio, because this would obviously be in the studio. Um, and we can also send back camera control from the connector back to the web presenter as well when it comes out. So you can control the cameras from the web presenter SDI monitoring output. You can control all the cameras because the camera number is actually set locally on the cameras themselves. Plus there's tally going back through there. So it's a very powerful solution and it creates a global live production system. Uh, also, we actually fixed a bug in this update. We actually in recently introduced. Now this caused the monitoring output of the web presenter to be the return audio from here only not its input audio, which is kind of annoying because it causes problems if people are using the web presenter for normal streaming. So now we've added a new menu to change the monitoring between the SDI input and the remote talkback audio on the web presenter, and that's in the web presenter menu. Uh, we also fixed another small bug that can interrupt the audio feedback if the SDI input was plugged in a bunch of times. So it's a good update. There's you know, the small bug fixes that always make their way into these new updates. Now the software will be available free of charge and it'll be available to download today. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about ATEM control panels. So we recently introduced some larger Tilme panels and they were received really well, but not every, everyone has really the space for a Tilme panel because you know, a Tilme panel's deeper. So we thought we'd add some new 1ME uh, models with more buttons. And that allows in more input buttons, but they're still small panels, so it's a really good combination. So if you can follow me down, and I'll show you down here, we've got some panels, the new models set up. So they're based on the larger panel designs, uh, but the new models are called ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel 20 and ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel 30. Um, but they've also got some nice features over the 10 input button. Because they're wider, we can fit a bit more. Um, so they now both control 4MEs, which you can see over here. So he's talking to the 4MEs. So, uh, and they've also got uh, four upstream keyers over here, and they've also got four downstream keyers. So that's pretty nice. Um, so you can use these panels with really big 4ME switches. So they're really, really nice. Um, so you can see that uh, you know we can control the buttons, and it's got the nice T-bar, which is really nice. Um, they also support, uh, oh, and they've got the 30 input one down here. And they have, they're tied together, so you can see them both move together. Um, now they've got multiple language support. You can do updates via USB and Ethernet. And also about repairability, these are the same, they use the same internal PCB modules as the larger panels. So you can actually repair them with the same parts and you can move the modules around and even swap them if you had a failure, you could move it in an emergency to a different part of the panel. So they're very repairable. Now I think these are great new models. Uh, now the new ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel 20 will be priced at 3795, and the new ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel 30 down there will be priced at 5495. We expect them to be shipping in a few weeks time, and they're a great addition to the ATEM panels. I really particularly love the 1ME panel, the 20 button one. It's small, but it's extremely powerful, so it's, it's almost like the perfect size. Now next I wanted to talk about the Blackmagic Studio camera. Now the original Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Plus model was actually based on the pocket camera. You know, we were trying to create an affordable studio camera. So to make it low cost, we actually took the pocket camera design and put it into a studio camera design. Well, the pocket camera electronics and put it in the studio camera design. And this made a really nice low cost HDMI model. However, we've been reworking on this design. We've been basically redesigning it because we wanted to add SDI connections. Um, and this would let us work with SDI switches. So we've done that. And we think it's very important because you know, when you buy a camera for a HDMI switcher, you really want to be able to use it with a more advanced SDI switcher later. So, you know, you can keep using your cameras even as you grow, and I think that's quite important. Okay, so the new model is called Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Plus G2. It's very similar, but it's got SDI connections added. So let me show you. Um, let me just remove this. I'll bring it out. Now, it's got all the features of the uh, older model. I'll just grab it. Here it is. Um, so it's got, like I was saying, it's got all the features of the old model, but it's got 12G SDI out and it's got 12G SDI in for the program return. Now the program return does the tally, the camera control and the talk back. 
Now you can also use uh, 3.5 mil headsets for talkback now because it's got the SDI in. And it also records Blackmagic RAW on USB discs. Uh, it works with the focus and zoom demands. Um, so it makes photographic lenses look like, you know, and feel like broadcast lenses. It's really nice. It even supports the REST um, control protocol if you use a USB Ethernet adapter because it doesn't have uh, Ethernet like the Pro models have. Um, but you can still use the camera control. So let me show you how it works. Um, so I'll plug in the 12G SDI. So I've got some 12G SDI connections around here. So I'll swing it around without bumping into my computer. I'll plug in some power. Do up the screw nut. There we go. So now it should be powering up. There we go, turn it on. So there we go. So we've got a picture, yeah, it's zoomed in. Um, so it's really nice. Um, now we have the focus and zoom demands, so I can uh, use photo lenses as broadcast lenses, like I was saying, so I can zoom in. So I've got this beautiful control. Um, I can focus. Uh, and I can even turn up the focus peaking a bit more. So I can change that. You can see that there on the side camera. So it's really nice. Just it's so beautiful. Now with the SDI input, um, we also have the program return. So if you can get a bit of a shot of that, there's the program return button has now been added to this camera as well. So there you go there, see? So cool. So that's the switcher output, I've got my rack here. Plus it also works with the tally light. So if I go into the ATEM software control, I'll get rid of this. I'll go to my control and you can see I can go to, there it is there. Um, and I can also do all the camera adjustments as well. So I've got the ability to do that. Actually, I should switch back to the camera so I can show you as I adjust it. So there it is there. It's really cool. Um, I can also adjust the camera color. And I can reset that. And I can also even adjust things like zoom all remotely. It's pretty cool. Um, now the switcher sends all this information to the camera through that SDI program return. So it's really cool. I think this is a really nice upgrade for the model. Um, now the new Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Plus G2 will be priced at 1345. So that's the same price as the old model. So it's available now. Um, it's a much better model. It'll actually replace the older model. And it's a great camera for ATEM Mini but works with all our SDI switches. So it's really, I think it's very nice. But it's not the only studio camera news we have. Uh, the micro studio camera's back. Um, now we couldn't build the old model. Um, we had parts problems, uh, all kinds of parts problems. So what we've done is we've redesigned it. We've also upgraded it. It was a good opportunity to upgrade it. Um, there was a bunch of things we wanted to add. So let me show you the new model first and then um, oh, we can talk about it further. I'll just move that aside. Put it over here. Here it is. So you can get a shot of that. So it does look similar. It even has the battery backup on the back and it's got the same uh, MFT lens mount so you can use the lenses you already own, but it's a much better, uh, has a much better 4K sensor. It's actually got the same color science and uh, sensor as the Studio Camera 4K model, uh, actually as this one. Um, so all the cameras match color really well. But one of the big things we've done is we've used uh, bayonet type mini BNC connectors. Uh, they, twist, they twist and lock on like regular BNC connectors. People kind of hated the old push on connectors we had because the cables could pop off. Um, but now we've gone to a locking BNC connector. Um, and the, the big thing though is these connectors handle 12G SDI. So the camera can now do 60 frames a second in Ultra HD. The old model could only do uh, 6G SDI on its connectors, so it was limited to 30 frames a second. So going to 60 frames a second will be fantastic for sports. And of course the camera can be switched to HD rates for HD work. Now the new model has a regular power connector on it, uh, which is simpler. And the USB uh, can actually record Blackmagic RAW to USB disks now. So that's a big update on this camera. In fact, the USB even supports the focus and zoom demands, you know, if you wanted to build some kind of studio camera. And it's even got the REST protocol in there if you use a USB to Ethernet adapter. Uh, so that way you actually have three different ways of controlling the camera. You can do it via HDMI when it's connected to an AT Mini. You can control it via the SDI program return input when you're connected to an SDI switcher or via Ethernet when you've used an e USB to Ethernet adapter. So the HDMI output has on-screen menus for changing the camera settings, a bit like how the Hyperdeca shuttle does. And you can use the buttons on the front to set the menus. 
uh, such as like camera number and other functions like that. Uh, so let me plug it in and I'll show you how it works. So I've got some video cables that I can plug in. Little mini BNC cables here that plug on, they're quite nice. And I've got a power connection over here, which I'll plug in. I'll screw up the power connection nice and tight. And I can bring it over here, so I'll bring this over this way a bit, so I can get a nice shot. So now we're using the camera control via the 12 GSDI input, and we've already set it to camera number two. So I can show you the camera working if I go back to the switcher control over here. So I'll press camera two, and you can see the tally lights changing. I'll turn the camera around a little bit so you can see it. See there? You can see the cam there's the camera's tally light. That's quite nice. Um, now we can go to the ATEM color correction software and we can do all the color correction stuff. So we've got the iris control there, which is pretty cool. We can also do the color changes. It's got the full uh, color corrector built into it. So I can move all the colors around and do all kinds of really nice color correction. Um, I can also control the zoom. So I can just zoom in, it's really cool. And I can even do the autofocus. There's an autofocus button there and I can control the autofocus. All that's remote. It's basically the same as the bigger camera, it's just without an LCD. Um, so it really means you can place cameras all over the set. Um, it's really small, so it's easy to hide. And you can get some really interesting shots with it. Now, I think this camera will be really popular. Um, the new Blackmagic Micro Studio Camera 4K G2 will be priced at 995. So it's very affordable. It's, but it's a true broadcast quality camera. Um, actually, it's better because it's got film gamma. So with the built-in color corrector, you get really cinematic looks from this camera. Uh, plus it records Blackmagic raw to USB disks. I mean, it really is amazing. And now we expect it to be shipping in October, um, but you can see it's so much better than the older model. So, okay, next we have another new camera. Um, we really love the pocket cinema cameras. Um, so I really wanna talk about this. Um, they produce amazing images, um, but we've been thinking about a more powerful model a uh, model designed for really high-end film uh, with different features. But the problem is it's a bit confusing to add another model of pocket camera with different features. Because, uh, you know, the pocket cameras do so many things. They're digital film cameras, but they also work as studio cameras with the A2 Minis. They have a lot of features. Um, and it makes it a bit hard to sort of change the features because you'd lose some features and not others. So we thought what we'd do is introduce a new model specifically designed for high-end film. And it uses the, block, uh, the pocket cinema camera uh, pro platform so we can use all the accessories, but it's actually a bit of a different camera. So the new model is actually called Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. It's the next generation of kind of our original cinema camera in some ways, it's, but it's obviously a lot more modern, but it's spiritually the same. It's designed specifically for high-end digital film. It's a very portable uh, digital film camera, of course. Uh, let me show you, I'll bring it out. Here it is here. There you go. So you can see the platform looks like a pocket cinema camera. Um, so you can use all the same battery extender and all the same accessories. In fact, I'll bring out the other camera that we've got rigged up with the pocket camera accessories. There it is there. So you can see, you know, um, it's all got the same accessories, but the internal electronics have been completely redesigned. Internally, it's a completely different camera. And so the features are actually quite different. Um, now the first big change is the media. This, use, this camera uses CF Express, and those cards are super fast, really small, and they're designed for film and video. I can show you the, the card here. There it is there. So just goes in the side. Um, it also has an L-mount lens. Um, so it's a very shallow mount, so it's very adaptable. So you can put like EF lenses and PL Cine lenses on and a lot more. Um, you can actually use the EF lenses from your pocket cameras if you've got them. But there's also some incredible uh, lenses for L-mount. So let me show you. So I'll, I'll turn on the camera. I'll take off, yep, yeah, the lens cap is off. Now let's have a look, I'll focus on something. So you can see it's, um, if, you, if you get it over there, it's really cinematic and the pictures are amazing. I'll do a recording. It's pretty cool, it's really nice. Um, and also it works vertically as well, so it switches around to vertical, so you can shoot digital film with vertical, which is pretty cool. Um, so obviously, talking about adapters, um, there is adapters, so I can show you there's an EF adapter here. I'll take off that. So there's an EF adapter, so we can put that on. I'll take off the all-mount lens. And put the EF adapter on. Now the camera's an EF, um, EF camera, so I can bring out an EF lens. Here's a small one we've got. A little wide angle one. So I can put that on. 
So now it's uh, got an EF lens on it. So you can see it's really simple. All that's nice. So you can see we can now frame, we've got a focus. There we go, we've got a nice EF lens on there. And of course you can get you know, other lens adapters like we've got a PL mount adapter here. So there's a nice big PL adapter. I'll put it on. There we go. And yeah, now I can put on big lenses like this, which I won't put on because we're hand holding it. And so, but you can really rig it in some most amazing ways with PL. Now the other big thing about this camera is uh, the image sensor. So. Uh, the reason the images look a bit different from this sensor is the size. We've got a full frame 6K sensor in this camera. So it's three times bigger than the, um, than the Super 35 sensor in the pocket cameras. It's got a three by two aspect ratio. So it's much, um, has much larger photo sites. And we've also incorporated the latest Blackmagic color science. So it produces some stunning images. So I'll show you if you can, you, there's a camera over there. If you can just get a shot down there, you can see the, there's the PL lens with the, so I'll remove the lens mount so you can see it better. I hate putting lenses down without lens caps. It just feels like the wrong way to treat glass. So you can look down there, I think if you can see a shot down there, you can get the shot of the large sensor. So you can see how nice that looks. Um, so it's a big sensor. I'll turn the camera off. Um, so I'll get rid of all these accessories and lenses. So you can see that the large sensor is full height, so you can use the anamorphic lenses without cropping. Uh, so you get the, the look of anamorphic with, you know, the way it's done properly. Um, plus the camera has an optical low pass filter installed by default. This is a high-end camera, so we, having the optical uh, low pass filter installed is really nice. Uh, plus we designed the filter specifically for this sensor, so it's matched to the sensor perfectly. Now as far as file formats go, it records uh, recording in Blackmagic RAW with proxy. So you get Blackmagic RAW quality and color science, plus you can load things like 3D lookup tables, and they're stored in the file, but they're not burned in, so you can disable the uh, 3D light and DaVinci later. Gives the colorist a lot of flexibility so you can turn on and off lights because they're not burned in. But the camera also records real-time proxies. So this camera records two streams. Well, one is the original uh, full resolution Blackmagic RAW and the other one's a H64 file in HD. So you can do things like cloud uh, uh, workflows and remote workflows in DaVinci Resolve without rendering off, needing to render dissolves. So let me show you. Um, so I just recorded a clip before. So I'll take the media card out. I'll bring it over if you can follow me down. I've got a card reader here. I can plug it into the plug it into the USB. There it is. So I'll get rid of this. And you see the media card here. And you can see there's the Blackmagic RAW file. Also wasn't holding it very steady. And then down inside the folder here we've got the proxies. You can see we've been using film gamma here. So the great thing about the proxies is it means you don't have to render proxies, so you can just start editing immediately, which is really nice. Um, so nice to have that built into the camera. So one thing now, um, we, one of our beta testers uh, did a shoot with the camera, and I'd love to show this to you. Uh, it really demonstrates how nice the image sensor in this camera is. So let's roll the video and you can check it out.
It's so nice. I mean, you can never do it justice having a camera here in the studio, but going out on a shoot looks incredible. The images from this camera are amazing. And it even has room to grow in the future because we've got space in the camera because we haven't put things like color correctors for live production in it. It's designed specifically for high-end film. So the new Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K will be priced at 2595 Again, the prices can vary a bit depending on government duties and taxes. It's just started production now, but it should be available. Uh, it's an amazing camera. You know, it's different to the pocket cameras. It's different to a lot of our other cameras. It's very advanced, but it has the benefits of the pocket cinema camera accessories. Uh, but it's got the massive image sensor. It's got the optical low-pass filter installed. It's got the faster CF Express media, and it records Blackmagic RAW, and it records proxies. It's just so nice to use, and the pictures look amazing. You know, I think it's going to really help uh, filmmakers on tight budgets. But um, we thought we could even go further with that. So we've got something quite exciting we've been working on. We wanted to make it even easier for people to create digital film. So we've been working on an app for the iPhone that turns it into a digital film camera. It's called Blackmagic Camera, and it brings the features of our cameras over to the iPhone. It includes the same user interface as our digital film cameras, but it unlocks all the manual controls. It basically allows you to manually control everything. It's got uh, higher quality recording options, and it transforms the phone into a digital film camera. So let me show you. I'll bring it out. I have an iPhone here. I'll just log into it and launch Blackmagic Camera. Um, so let's, uh, uh, we're running that now. So this way, here we go. Actually, I'll show you there. You can see it there. We can get a shot of that. Um, so I'll use the side camera actually, because I think you'll get a better shot because we can zoom in on that. We've got a camera just off to the side here. So I don't know if you can see that. There it is there. So you can see we've got all the same settings that we have on our other cameras. You can see along the top there all the camera settings and we've got histogram and audio meters down there. You can bring up the audio controls um, and time code. Um, so like on uh, our other cameras, you can change some of the settings by pushing them. It's a bit hard to use it this way. I'll turn off the auto. So you now I've got the different color temperature settings. You can see that. If you can get a shot of that with the different color temperature settings, you can adjust it manually. But we'll turn it back on auto. Um, so it's just like the other cameras. There's also a lot of assist features. So you can click on the Focus Assist tab up there. See if you get a shot of that. You can turn it on the, the Zebra. So we've got Zebra pattern over the display and you've got all sorts of other things as well. So I'll turn that back off again. Um, we've got like grids, focus peaking, false color. There's all kinds of stuff in here. It's like basically a lot of things. Um, so we're back on the main screen now. And there's also metadata, so you can tag metadata, tag files. That's the button down the bottom there. See, you can see that looks familiar. It's the same metadata screen as our other cameras. Now you can also choose the record format. On modern phones you can do ProRes and H6.5, um, but it also records real-time proxies. So if I go into the settings tab down there, you can see there's the settings and I can change the, the formats there. See, there it is there. You can go through the different settings. I'll go back to the camera. Um, so to record, it's really easy. Um, it adds time code to the file automatically, so you can record, uh, and you can record on the phone or external disks. So let's uh, record, and you can see, now we're recording some of the studio. You can see behind the rack over there. So it's pretty easy. So it's very exciting. And also you can, rotate, you can rotate the camera vertically, so you can you can shoot vertical aspect ratios, but we actually have another cool feature called stealth mode, which is currently turned on. Now, to shoot widescreen, you really need to use two hands, which you can see I'm struggling with here. But uh, holding the uh, phone uh, vertically is much easier. Um, but then, of course, the aspect ratio is vertical, and broadcasters don't want vertical aspect ratios. So if you rotate the uh, phone vertically, what we've done is if you rotate the phone vertically, it crops the sensor, and it gives you a horizontal aspect ratio from a, uh, ratio from a vertical phone. So let me show you. So if you can get a shot of that over the side there, I'll rotate the camera, and there it is. See? That's stealth mode. Now, it moves everything to the top of the phone because the lower part of the phone is really where you hold it. It's like a handle. But the lower part of the screen is used when you're changing settings. So like, so if I go to those focus settings, see that stuff all comes up down the bottom there, if you can see that. So it's all still there. So no one will know you're shooting professional widescreen video when you're out in the crowd. And I can start recording. There I go, see, now I'm doing a recording. So that's really cool. So it just looks like, you know, you're doing a normal vertical aspect ratio shooting. Um, you can set that in the preferences. If you want normal vertical aspect ratio, you can set it in the preferences. Um, but uh, let's look at some of the other features. Um, so you might have noticed, if you get a bit of a shot there, there's a media tab. Um, now, this is where the recordings are stored. Um, but, uh, and yeah, look, the Blackmagic Camera app is standalone. You can copy the media with the Files app. You can, uh, well, on newer phones, you can record to external disks. But Blackmagic Camera is a lot more powerful than that. 
It can connect and upload media directly to Blackmagic Cloud. So it means the phone can shoot and upload clips directly into the DaVinci Resolve bin. And it makes it a truly global post-production workflow. Um, now we recently introduced Blackmagic Cloud Server, um, a project server which lets you share your project worldwide or even between different computers that you work with. But now we're gonna take that much further because the um, uh, we're gonna basically out log into Blackmagic Cloud and storage in there. So this phone's already logged into Blackmagic Cloud so it makes it faster to show you, but let's go to the media tab and I'll show you what's in the media tab. So there you go, you can see the clips I just recorded. Um, but it's better to shoot directly into DaVinci Resolve's project. So let me show you how this works. But before I shoot, let's go over to DaVinci Resolve because we need to create a new project. So I'll pop over to DaVinci, I'll just leave that there for a sec. Let's come over. So I'll open up DaVinci. Now, we have a new project window, a new new project window. <laughs> um, I'll just call it demo. Now this new window is for creating new cloud projects. Um, we need to enable remote cameras. And we also, um, so that the DaVinci, we can load the media directly into DaVinci. So let's do that. Um, allow remote cameras. Also we'll select multi-user so multiple people can use the project at the same time. Uh, and then we'll press new project. There we are. So this new project's now been created in a library that has shared users. Uh, so other people can get to the media. So let's go back to the phone now and uh, we'll have a look and we should see it come up. There it is. So now we've selected that. So the app is logged into Blackmagic Cloud. So you can see the projects and now we've selected the project. So let's go back to the camera screen if you can get a view of that. And you can see that the project name is actually above the time codes. This is how you tell that it's connected to a project. It's actually the project's listed above the thing, above the time code. So let's do a recording. I'll move my arms around here, it's a bit horrible. Okay, so there we go. Um, It's pretty cool, stop that. And uh, now we can uh, look, go and look at the media in, uh, in DaVinci Resolve. Actually, no, let's look at the media tab first. Sorry, I forgot to show you this. It's uploading, so you can see it uploading that clip to Blackmagic Cloud. So it's currently uploading the proxy file, which is much faster to upload. So you can see there's a progress bar, there's a little cloud icon in there to show you that it's uploaded. It's uploaded there now. So we'll head across to the DaVinci bin and check it out. So over here on DaVinci, um, so when recording the first file, it'll automatically create a remote camera folder for you, which it's just done. So you can see the remote camera folder's appeared. And now if you go inside that folder, you can see there's the clip in there. Okay, now we've got the clip there. Now the clip will uh, look offline momentarily while it's downloading, but now the clip's there, let's do an edit with it. So I'll bring it up into the viewer, and I'll just depend it to the timeline, and there we are. Now I can, there we go. Now you can see that the, uh, you can set the camera to upload proxies only, which is what's happened here. Uh, or you can upload proxies in original media, but it'll always upload the proxies first. Plus, I can also set DaVinci Resolve to download proxies only as well, which works great if you're operating remotely. Uh, or if you're using an iPad, you know, you just want the proxies in that. Plus, you, um, you don't have to download your media to the computer because you can download it to network storage and then you can all just share that on the local network. Any DaVinci system that opens this project will see these clips appear automatically. Plus, if any DaVinci Resolve user adds media to the project, it'll automatically sync. So for example, if someone adds a clip to one of the projects in some location, the uh, clip will come across, everybody gets it. Uh, and the clips just appear for everybody, it's all fully automatic. There's really nothing complex you need to do. So let's do another recording and we'll uh, see another clip come in. So we'll do it here, go back to the camera, and we'll do recording. And we'll record the studio camera there. The connectors, and that's a bit blurry, I should refocus. There we go, so now that's done. Now we'll go across to the uh, media page, you can see that uploading. But uh, more interestingly, let's move across to DaVinci, because we can see it come over. Um, so you can see over here. Um, and you'll see the clip will now upload. It's already uploaded, and it should appear in the DaVinci bin. There's the offline clip come in, so it'll be downloading the content now. There it goes, there's the clip. So we'll double click that and we'll add that into the timeline. You can see how, oops, there it is. There's a shot we just took. There's our other shot. Um, now if you've got other media on your phone, you can also copy that over. So let's uh, upload the original shots we took uh, before we created the project because we want to be able to upload 
that into our new project as well. So I'll show you where that is. So if we go across here, we can say um, all clips, and you can see the early clips we did. There they are there. So let's load one of those. We can upload that to the cloud. Into demo, and upload. There we go. Now if we go back to the media tab, you can see that's now uploading. And that'll also go across in the DaVinci bin. Plus you can also upload clips from the photo album and in the photo as well. But let's go across and have a look and um, you'll see that extra clip come up. There it is, there's the offline clip first as it first comes in. That's because the information about the clip comes in before the clip itself, before all the media comes in. There it goes. There's the clip we first took. Okay, now we're recording. There you go. Now, you can even record from multiple phones at the same time. So I have someone with a phone out the front. So let's record together. So when I start recording, let's uh, record on both phones, the phone out the front here and the phone. I'll go back to my camera and I'll go back to the camera screen. And now I'm just to double check, I'll go make sure I'm still in the bin. I've got to still make sure I've reselected the project I want to record into. That would have been bad. All right, so let's uh, go across and start recording on the two phones. So I'll let you know when we're ready to go. I'll record over the back here. Okay, ready? Let's record. So here I am recording some of the hyperdecks. Hang on that. There it is across there. Let's go across this monitor over here. This is our DaVinci project. It's just a TV, the DaVinci project. And I can go down to panel. All right, let's stop. Now if I go to the media page, you'll see that that recording's uploading. Um, so what we'll do is we'll want to see both clips appear in the in the bin. So you can see there it's almost finished uploading. So let's go across the DaVinci bin and have a look. So we've got three clips in here at the moment and we'll wait for the other two clips to come in. There they are, both clips have come in at the same time and they're all both downloading now. There's the first clip, it's appeared. Looks like that was the one from my camera. There's the second clip. All right, let's have a look at the first clip. Let's record. There it is, playing. All right, now let's have a look at the second clip that Richard took. Yeah, it's like a wide shot. Looks cool. Okay, let's append that shot to the timeline. There we are there. So I'll scroll along. You can see that it's the shot we took. That's pretty cool. Now, we can even use the sync bin to edit between the two different cameras. So what we'll do is um, I'll turn video only on because we don't want audio from two different cameras. Then I can go into the sync bin, which is over here. Now it'll show us the two clips as they appear in the, uh, against the timeline. So if I play them, there we go. So now we can see both side by side. That's automatically matching them. So let's do and edit, we will not, I want to edit some of this in, so let's find a good spot. A bit where it moves across there. Let's go, we'll pick this, then we'll do a source override edit, and then we'll go back to the timeline. So that's it there. And there we go. Now we've done an edit. This monitor over here. Just the DaVinci project. It's just a TV, the DaVinci project. There you go, because the source override will automatically get that clip out of the layer above it matching the time code of the timeline. So it'll automatically sync all these camera shots up as you put them into the timeline using the source override edit, which is this one here. So you can do multicam on these shots. So imagine if you've got multiple cameras at like a protest march, you can use the sync bin or multicam to get the best view that's, you know, of all the different cameras that are coming in in real time. And it's even faster if you're using a speed editor. On the speed editor panel, you just hold down key number two, which is the second camera, and scroll the dial along. It'll just add it into the, into layer two on the timeline automatically as you search, as you scroll the dial and it's all in sync. It's really the fastest way to do multicam. The speed editor is fantastic. Um, so I think this is really exciting. It's pretty cool to be able to do multicam like this just from multiple cameras. Now you might have also noticed when we go back to the phone that there was also a chat tab. So if we look here, there's the chat tab. Um, now this phone's connected directly into the DaVinci Resolve tab. 
So you could have like a, um, sorry, in the DaVinci Resolve chat, so you can have an editor and a producer working in different parts of buildings and different, even in different locations and have multiple cameras on, you know, in the field uh, recording and you can all chat. So let me show you. So what I'll do is I'll go over and type a message in DaVinci. There's the DaVinci chat down there. Great shot. And then you'll see that come up over on the phone. So you can see it there. And you can also do a reply. So I'll do a reply. There you go, and I've sent that. And it'll appear back on DaVinci. Let's check it out. So there it is there. Um, now it'll appear on all the DaVinci systems, even the iPads. Now both messages are on the same side because it's actually, I'm sending messages to myself. But if someone else types a message, which we have Richard in front, he can type a message as well. You'll see it's on the other side. So if you could type a message, Richard. There you go. So I think this is very exciting. I think it's gonna, this whole workflow is gonna revolutionize post-production. Um, you can use as many cameras as you like. You know, broadcasters can edit stories in real time and they can upload them as the situation changes. I think it'll be pretty cool. Now the Blackmagic uh, camera iPhone app should be available today. And the best news is it's totally free of charge. So anyone can get digital film using their phone. Now the Blackmagic cloud storage will also be online today. It's currently in beta as we want to make sure everything's working really well. I expect we'll get some good feedback once people start using it. Now the DaVinci Resolve project libraries are $5 a month as they are now. And the Blackmagic cloud storage costs are based on the amount of storage you need. We've also chosen a bit of a different approach to the pricing. You know, a lot of cloud sort of products have a per user charge, but they normally sort of trick you into spending, you know, they specify the minimum number of users. So what sounds like, for example, what sounds like $25 you know, a month per user, it's really $125 if the minimum users is five, which we think is a bit misleading. So what we thought to keep it simple, we'll just have a single price, host price for the storage. Then you can have as many people as you need. It makes it simple and you can just share your project with as many people as you need and there's no extra charges for that. Now in reality, there's actually a cap on the number of users. It varies as you get more storage because you've got to do that, otherwise everything goes crazy. Now the new Blackmagic cloud storage should be online today. Uh, the prices are actually listed when you create the storage, it'll tell you what the prices are. Uh, however, that's not all we've done. What we've also done is we've added Blackmagic Cloud support to the Ursa Broadcast G2. Uh, and it includes a new media browser that's in the uh, in the camera. So let me show you, we'll go across the Black, um, to the Ursa Broadcast here. Um, here it is over here. So now to save time, um, it's already logged in. Uh, but you can log in manually as well, uh, or you can use the phone to authenticate. Um, because we've got a phone you know, connected for mobile data. Uh, also, this uh, camera's rigged with all the ENG kit. Uh, it's got that ENG kit installed, and the phone is mounted on the side here. Uh, and then it's plugged into the USB. Um, so anyway, let's check out the new media page. I'll move out of the way so we can get the camera in here. So there it is there. Um, so we can go to the new media page. There it is there. So this is a really nice addition to the camera because you can you know, scroll and browse media in here. Anyway, let's select the project. So we'll go back in. We need to go to the side tab there. I'll get my head out of the way. We can select the project there. There it is. Um, now it'll automatically shoot and create proxies. Um, and just like the Blackmagic uh, camera uh, iPhone app, uh, it'll upload the proxies first. Um, so we'll go out of the menu here. And you can see that the project name is actually above the time code. Um, so you can tell which project you're logged into. Okay, now I'm doing a recording. There it is there. So that's pretty nice. Pretty cool. Okay, now I can stop. Anyway, let's go back to the media page. Then we can see it uploading, if I get my head out of the way, so you can see, let's close the tab, you can see it uploading there. Um, now the camera settings allow upload of proxies only, or you can do proxies in original media. But let's look at back at DaVinci Resolve and we'll see the clip coming in. So I'll just close the chat window and it'll upload into the same bin. There's a clip appeared. Now just waiting for the media upload. There it goes, the clip's arrived. So now we can double click that, add it into the timeline. And there's our edit playing back. And there's our shot from our there was some broadcast with an amazing lens. So cool. So it's just camera, you know, footage from different cameras coming in. There it is there. 
so nice. So you can get all this uh, media on the Blackmagic Cloud website as well. Um, it's all there to download because obviously that's the link to all this stuff. Um, it's also the only place you can delete uh, sync to media because you don't want camera operators accidentally deleting your media. Um, and make sure you don't lose shots that you've got in an edit. Um, now there's a new storage app on the Blackmagic Cloud. So let me show you, I'll go to Blackmagic Cloud and I'll show you. So if we go back to the computer here, and go to the web browser, there's the Blackmagic Cloud site. You can see we've got a few new items added in there. And we can navigate down and click on the storage and go down to our, here's our project here. So there's a demo uh, project. And we can go into the camera uploads folder and then proxies, because we've only been loading proxies, we haven't got any original media. So there they are there, and you can even click on one and you can download it. There it goes. Now it's downloading the files. So you can just download the media from here and you can also delete the clips from here. Um, so it's really exciting. Now I think this uh, workflow will be pretty amazing. You know, imagine shooting on both phones and professional cameras all at the same time with the media all uploading to a broadcaster in real time. Um, imagine new sh you know, stories being updated with new shots uh, each time they play. Currently I've noticed a lot of news channels just repeat the storage multiple times, but you could keep adding new shots into those stories and have them updated every time they play. It's pretty cool. Plus, of course, DaVinci Resolve's not only an editor, it's also a color corrector, a visual effects tool, and an audio post-production solution. So all these different skills can all be working together from any point in the world. So it's really very exciting, and everyone gets the same media all at the same time. It's an incredible workflow. Now, as far as availability, this Ursa Broadcast software, we're still working on it. Now, we'll be showing it at IBC, but I think it's probably gonna be early November when it's available, but we'd like to public beta it sooner than that. Now, it's a very big change to Ursa Broadcast G2, but the software update will be available free of charge to anyone who owns an Ursa Broadcast G2. They'll get the update. Um, and also, you might have been wondering why the uh, new Blackmagic Cinema Camera records proxies, and this is why. It means we can actually get this software over to the Cinema Camera later. Um, but first, we'll perfect it on the Ursa Broadcast G2, and then we'll port the software over to the new Blackmagic Cinema Camera so you know, um, uh, cinematographers can use it as well. Uh, plus, we also want to add Blackmagic Cloud support to the Blackmagic Cloud stores. So you don't need to download uh, the media via the DaVinci system, you know, the Blackmagic Cloud Store could do it. So that's why we call them cloud stores. The idea is to link them into this whole thing. Then everybody can just relink to the media on the local network and it only needs to be downloaded once and automatically because uh, the media will download to the cloud store automatically and it'll save a lot of time. So we've been really working very hard on this. I think it's a really exciting workflow and I can't really wait to see how it's used. I think there'll be lots of small improvements we can make as we get feedback and talk to people at shows. So that's about it for this update. Um, I hope you can travel to IBC and see all these new products working. It's been very exciting working on all these new technologies. It's a privilege to be able to do it. Um, and I also want to thank everyone at Blackmagic Design. We've worked incredibly hard on these new products and software updates. It's just been really hard work getting all this stuff to work together, much harder than we thought. But it's very exciting. And the fun part's when you see all this working for the first time. Anyway, thanks for watching and please tra travel safely if you're heading to IBC. Take care and bye for now.